Good afternoon, good afternoon. Let's get started. <clears throat> Welcome to Managing Resources to Move the Needle for MCH Impact. My name is Lou Margolis and I'm with the National MCH Workforce Development Center. I'll be serving as the moderator. We are in for a treat this afternoon because we have the opportunity to work and study with two accomplished and highly regarded maternal and child health professionals. Dorothy Salenti has worked in local and state public health agencies in North Carolina for more than 20 years. She is primarily interested in improving systems of care for underserved women and children. She's a clinical associate professor in the Department of Maternal and Child Health at the UNC Gillings School of Global Public Health, where she directs the National Maternal and Child Health Workforce Development Center, a cooperative agreement with the Health Resources Services Administration and Maternal and Child Health Bureau. She has served as principal investigator for more than 25 contracts and grants, ranging from training grants to public health systems research awards. Dr. Salenti received a bachelor's degree in psychology from Duke University. And are you going to tell us where you're going to be watching the Duke UNC game tonight? And I always hope for a tie. <laughs> and a master's both in public health and social work, as, a, um, as well as a doctorate in health policy and management from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Our second stellar speaker this afternoon. Karen Trierweiler is a master's prepared nurse midwife and experienced public health professional with over 30 years experience in public health. She served as the Title V MCH director in Colorado for 11 years and under her leadership Colorado experienced a 40% reduction in teen pregnancy rates over five years and a 21% reduction in infant mortality. That's great. <laughs> that, that, that deserves some applause I think. <laughs> she is current <laughs> She is currently a consultant and founding partner of the Total Population Health with primary interest in MCH and organizational development. She received a Distinguished Service Award from the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment in 2012, a recognition of distinction for state maternal and child health leadership from the Association of Maternal and Child Health Programs in 2016, and a Lifetime Achievement Award from the Maternal and Child Health Bureau for Excellence in MCH in 2017. Please join me in welcoming Karen and Dorothy. Thanks, Lou, and um, thank you guys for coming to this session. We were worried because we were going up against the feds, and we appreciate that you, that you chose to come to this session, and I know other people will fill you in on what happens at the other session, so thanks very much. Um, well, I'm excited to join you today. Dorothy and I have given this talk um, once before last summer, and we are very um, excited to be back and talking about this very important topic. And I feel honored to be presenting with my colleagues from the Workforce Development Center. If you haven't had the chance to work with them, I highly recommend it. They're awesome. So today what we're going to do is we're going to talk a little bit about managing resources. And we're going to divide up this session into sort of two parts. Managing resources is really referring to how we manage our human capital, our people, our greatest asset, and how we manage our financial resources. So the first half of the session, we're going to talk a little bit about organizational culture and workforce management. And the second half, we're going to talk about financial considerations. And Dorothy has a tool called the Lean Canvas, which is really a, um, a fantastic way to be thinking about how we utilize our funds. So that's our plan. Resource management, again, some of you may have seen this document that was uh, generated by the De Beaumont Institute in concert with uh, a number of other public health organizations where they identified strategic skills for the public health workforce. And resource management is one such skill. So we're talking about managing the recruitment and career paths of the workforce, as well as the acquisition, retention, and management of our fiscal resources. That's resource management. So why is it a strategic skill and why is it important? So sound financial management of both our human and financial resources are foundational to our impact. Resources are the infrastructure for our work. And people are, are primarily where we're putting most of our funding for staff or into contracts for our partners. How we manage our money and our people 
dictates our MCH impact. We want to be intentional about our decision making and think about how we're putting our dollars and how we're resourcing our people and, and who we're bringing into our organizations to do this work in order to make sure that both our finances and our human capital are working in concert to move us forward in addressing maternal and child health. The more thoughtful we are about management of staff, use of our money, the better our programs are going to be in terms of improving MCH. And sadly, research management as a strategic skill is not universally understood or practiced. Most of us didn't learn it in our um, uh, education. And um, it's very common in our settings that these are the things you kind of learn on the job or when you do them wrong. So we want to correct that. So I want to talk a little bit about some of the factors that um, um, are important in terms of this thoughtful management of, of staff and our sort of human capital resources. And that brings me to a discussion of organizational culture in the workforce. So culture really refers to an organization's personality. Culture dictates how we work. It is the attitudes, the values, the norms, the practices, and the behavioral expectations and beliefs that all come together in the setting to really sort of dictate the norms and mores of the organization. Culture influences all interactions and outcomes in the workplace. It plays a huge role in staff engagement, in staff's ability to be productive, in operational effectiveness, and ultimately in impact. Because the idea has to be translated into action in order for us to make a difference. Does that make sense to everybody? So one of the things that's very important is that we have to establish clarity about our culture, around the culture that we hope to create. And this really flows from the leadership's level on down. If our culture is healthy and positive, it leads to staff engagement and productivity. People are able to do their best work, and the culture supports that, which has an impact on our outcomes. And the converse is also true. If our culture is not healthy, if it's negative, if, if it's toxic, then it's hindering our ability to be effective, not facilitating our ability to be effective. So this notion of culture is an important one. Now, there was an article written, by, um, and it was in Fast Company magazine in about 2012. It's on your reference list at the end. It's called Culture Eats Strategy for Lunch. And this article is trying to convey that culture is probably one of the most important drivers of success in your organizations. Its power is greatly underappreciated. It forms the organizational infrastructure. Culture is unwritten. People are quick to understand what the culture is like and quick to adopt it, to conform, which is great if you have a lot of positive cultural norms and which is less optimal if you don't. Great leadership or brilliant strategy really ultimately pales in the face of, of um, when you don't have operational excellence. And operational excellence is largely influenced by your culture. Does that make sense, you guys? Kind of seeing that link between culture and outcomes? Too often, culture develops unintentionally. So what we want to be thinking about is being more intentional about our culture and the impacts that it has in our organization. We want to be um, aware of what's going well and what isn't. And we want to create the clarity around these uh, values, beliefs, norms that we want to see in our organizations, along with the vision, the mission, and the operational expectations for staff. So clarity is key around culture. It's critical in staff engagement and performance, and again, one of the biggest drivers of success. So most of you in this room are, you know, affiliated in some way with public health, and you probably would say that there is a culture of public health. So what I'm going to ask you to think about just for the next, like, 30 seconds is, what do you think are some of those cultural norms that, that pretty much, you know, apply kind of across the board in public health? 
Could be a word, could be a phrase. Lou's going to chat down uh, or write down a few of your ideas for me. And then I'll show you the results of an informal poll I conducted last week. Thoughts that you have. What do you think are some core tenets of public health culture? These can be facilitators or inhibitors. Yeah, Rachel? Okay. Okay. Government. The government role. Other, other notions. Yes. Purpose. Purpose driven. Great. Thank you. Other ideas. Passion. Anything else come to mind? Remember, no right or wrong answers. Inclusion. Thank you. Yes. Data. Thanks. Thanks, Lynn. Yeah. Long-term focus. That's a good one. Funding. <laughs> well, that's a very good point. So last week, oh, go ahead. Two more. Sustainability. Thank you. Yeah. Lots of requirements, right? It's pretty structured. Last week, I did an informal poll of 11 of my colleagues. I asked the same question. Give me your top three um, uh, factors that you think about, words, phrases, when we think about the culture of public health. So I'll do that big reveal. And you guys get on. And again, small pool, 11 people. I put up here what came up at least four to six times in terms of people's responses, all right? This is not scientific. Lou, just cover your ears right now. Um, uh, Data-driven, evidence-based, science-based. Somebody brought that up earlier. Collaborative. Again, values, equity-driven. Really thinking a lot about doing work that is, uh, we want to do good for all. One of my respondents wrote the following sentence. We're in the fight against social ills and corporate greed that deprives society, especially those vulnerable, of equitable health, well-being, and opportunity. It's an inspiring statement, right? Process-oriented, sometimes to the detriment of results, a lack of a results orientation. To your point about funding, we're under-resourced and overworked. And sometimes this can lead to a scarcity mindset where we continue to take on more work without adequate resources, which can lead to a loss of focus, and that can further impact our ability to get results or outcomes, because that is a cultural norm. You just do the work. You don't worry about how to resource it. Um, and then we're not nimble, adaptable, or innovative, or risk-averse, and that gets back to someone's earlier point about government. Government is, you know, kind of the, the last adapter on the innovation curve. And sometimes we tolerate suboptimal conditions for too long. So you guys hit a lot of these. And I want you to think a little bit about it as we continue our discussion. What, what are some cultural norms? Again, some of these are facilitative and some of these aren't inhibitive, right? So a healthy culture then, as we said, is intentionally built on a clear set of values and norms that actively guide the operations. From, you know, it, it's pretty pervasive from the top down. This is who we are, this is how, how we work. That's culture. We want to strive for a mission-first, people-centric culture with engaged leaders and managers, focus and clarity, which leads to motivation, connection, cohesion, spirit. Those are some of the characteristics of healthy work cultures. I say people-centric instead of people First, because our work is about the mission, and our greatest asset, which is our people, need to come together with clarity in how we all can do that work. So it's about the mission, and it's about how people can best be employed in service of the mission, and it's also about keeping the best interests of people at heart. Does that all make sense? Great. So healthy work culture leads to employee engagement, productivity, operational excellence, and that's how we get impact, because we do have to do something in order to make a change, right? And again, people, our greatest asset. 
Sometimes we confuse treating people well with making them feel good. So what I want to do next is I want to talk a little bit briefly about some strategies that we can employ um, in service of our workforce that also uh, mirror some of the healthy sort of organizational culture types of qualities that we'd like to have in place. And I want to start with effective hiring and onboarding. So hiring is probably one of the most important decisions that are made in organizations. Because again, it's all about who, who we have in the workforce. The thing that is so challenging in our state systems about hiring is the amount of time it takes to hire and the amount of sort of red tape around hiring. It's not just a simple process of posting a job, getting in applications, doing an evaluation and hiring. There is lots and lots of barriers in place for hiring. Our ultimate goal, though, should be to hire the best candidate or not to hire anyone at all. And believe me, I spent 28 years in the state workforce, and I know that desperation. I know that feeling of desperation when you've been without the help for so long, when the work is piling up, when the staff can take on no more. And that is when, you know, this uh, tenet becomes even more important. So what I'm asking you to do is to think about what can you do in your current setting to make sure that this is always where you land up, always with the best person for the job either with temporary employees, contract employees, workload redistribution, prioritization, leaving some work undone, those sorts of strategies so that you can really embrace this philosophy. And I'm also going to ask you to avoid the least worst scenario. You've waited for months to get your list of candidates, and you get that list, and you take the least worst person on the list, right? I'm not criticizing you. I'm saying I know that desperation. Do not do it. Do not do it. Resist the urge. Think of other ways. The last thing that I'll say, well, it's actually not the last thing I'll say, but on this topic is um, don't let inexperienced managers hire alone. While hiring itself is a subjective process, there, there is learning that comes from experience. And there's also an advantage to having a small team of people that are hiring and assessing candidates. If you haven't done that before, if you're new to the job, you need support, coaching, and mentoring in that process, and you need to not be alone in doing it. And that is not casting any aspersions against your knowledge, skills, abilities, or capacity. Keep in mind that the current generation that we have in our workforce are not going to stay in the job for 28 years like me, and I don't think that's a bad thing. They're not staying for multiple years. It's better to get the best candidate for three years than a suboptimal person for 20, right? We've all been there. We want to look for people that can also traverse what I like to call the big little continuum, aspirations to operations. We want people that understand the vision, who have the passion for the work, but they can drive that vision into action. Because without the doing, nothing ever changes, right? Second point, we want to hire for future team needs. What do we need on the team in the future? And do we need the same position rehired again? Don't just rehire a position because you've got a position. Sometimes it's better to have fewer, more highly skilled people than it is just multiple bodies. Regardless of your FTE count, you don't have to fill every FTE that you have. And I know there's a whole big deal about the legislature about that too, but, but you don't have to fill everyone. We want to aim for cognitive diversity and inclusion. Somebody brought inclusion in. So in cognitive diversity, ultimately what we're looking for is people who don't think the same way, right? We want different perspectives. We want different learned and life experiences that inform where people are coming from. We want different cultural experiences that all come together in the workplace to fight the power of groupthink, to harness the power of the collective brain. And this cognitive diversity depends less on inherent traits, age, gender, race, ethnicity, sexual orientation, and more on external um, uh, acquired traits. Your lived experience, your culture, your life, your perspective. 
So keep that in mind when we're thinking about this notion of diversity and inclusion in the workplace. And then um, just a quick plea for onboarding. You know how desperate we all are. We've waited months. We get the person in. It's their first day. You get them in. You, you slam them into their space. You like give them a cup of coffee and a handshake, and then maybe you see them like in, in two months from now. We got to make sure that we treat our people, new people, as that investment. So our onboarding process needs to be comprehensive, detailed, and long. It's our chance to mold and influence. It's our chance to welcome them. It's our chance to assess their competence and to introduce them to our culture. And it's also our opportunity to know whether or not we need to release them during the probationary period. And if you need to release them during the probationary period, please do that. That is a staff engagement strategy, and I'm going to talk more about that in a minute. Okay, number two, fostering people's inherent sense of power. How many people are doing an organizational or governmental staff engagement survey on a regular basis? Anybody? Yeah. Our state does one every two years. Absolutely nothing wrong with that. It's good to know where people are at. The irony of doing these surveys is that we need to engage people or re-engage them because the cultures of our organizations remove people's inherent sense of power, which disengages them and requires re-engagement. So let's talk a little bit about maybe how we don't have to go through that process of disengagement and we can keep people engaged and we don't have to re-engage them. And that, again, is fostering people's inherent sense of power. What staff want in their job is purpose, autonomy, and mastery. Somebody brought up purpose as a public health culture, and that's so true. We have an awesome purpose, right? Who can't get behind maternal and child health? At lunch, Lou said, maternal and child health is, is the underpinning of everything, right? We all start out there. So that is a huge plus for us. People also then want clear expectations about why they're doing the work, what needs to be done. Because people want to be successful. They want to act on that meaningful purpose. Autonomy, a little harder, right? Decision making is controlled in our organizations way up here sometimes. And we, don't, we just feel like we just carry out sort of random orders, right? Is that true sometimes? You need trust. Control. You need some control over your work. Psychological safety. You need to feel safe to speak up, to share your thoughts, your ideas, your insights, your opinions without fear of consequences, a loss of status, or some sort of a, of a um, uh, it's not going to be detrimental to your career. And we need ongoing feedback. And this is both positive, constructive, and developmental. This notion of radical candor, and we'll get into that in just a couple of minutes. And then the third uh, uh, desired, uh, um, what people desire in the workplace is mastery. Opportunities to learn and grow continuously. And people want to work with skilled colleagues. And this is why releasing people during the probationary period who don't have the competence for the job is a staff engagement strategy. All of you have probably worked with people who can't do the job. Is that frustrating to you? Does that get in the way of your success? Yes. If we uh, meet these desires, if we inculcate a core set of expectations and behaviors, and then we ask people to practice them and we're consistent, people then are engaged, and, successful, and engaged people are successful. So this whole piece, and Daniel Pink did a really nice job in the book Drive outlining all these elements. So if you're interested in this topic, it's interesting reading. And a key component in all of this is creating clarity. Everyone's got to row in the same direction. Everyone needs to understand what's the vision, what's the mission, why am I here, what's my job, how do I contribute, how am I supposed to act. All that needs to be made clear, and it needs to be consistently uh, I'm going to use the word enforced, although it's a little strong, in the workplace. People need to understand this is how, culture, we do our work, right? Does that make sense to everybody? Positive cultural norms facilitate. Negative cultural norms, very detrimental here. OK, the last one, competent and cohesive leadership and management. 
And, and I think in public health, we really fall down here. Job one for a manager is operational excellence. Their sole job is management, not to do program work, not to be the content expert. They are creating cohesive teams that do, again, action, meaningful work on time. It can't be five years from now, right? That's your number one job. Management is undervalued in public health because what happens? The management tract is the way to give hardworking people a promotion and more money because our systems don't have career paths for content experts or individual performers. So we end up promoting people out of what they're good at into something that they're not good at and they don't like and they don't want to do. So people need to have the requisite knowledge, skills, and abilities before they get a management position. And they need to have extensive coaching and mentoring to be successful as a manager. And we need to value good management. If you've ever had a good supervisor, some, I had a lot of good supervisors, and then I got a bad one. Man, did, did I understand what I was missing. Is this true? True? You know the difference. Poor management and supervision is common. It is the top reason why staff leave. If you have any kind of exit surveys, most people will say they left because of their supervisor. Again, managers are engendering trust. They're facilitating psychological safety. They're getting people to speak up, to constructively debate the best strategies and ideas. People want regular contact with their supervisor. They want feedback. They want to know how they're doing. They want to hear, where am I doing well? How can I improve? The job of managers is to prepare staff for their next job. And managers are not responsible for our happiness, for our career growth, or our motivation. We're responsible for that. But as managers, we are responsible for putting in place the conditions where people can do their best work. Agree? Does everyone agree? We want to retain the staff that have the needed skills, and we want to help people who can't do the work or are unhappy in the work to move on. And that can either be by um, uh, pe people through attrition. Our goal is not 100% retention in our systems. Our goal is to retain the people who are able to do the job and are successful. Sometimes attrition is a positive for both the person and the organization. And we also want to consider reskilling people. Because sometimes there's not a path upward, but there's a path laterally. And when people are interested in opportunities to learn and grow, that can take place laterally as well with a different position or looking at what you're good at and, and matching that up to other jobs or opportunities that might be available in the organization. All right, the last time we did this talk, Dorothy and I, people asked me afterward to talk a little bit more about this notion of psychological safety and feedback. So I'm going to spend just a few minutes on this before we go into our exercise. So again, psychological safety is that comfort that you have in sharing your thoughts and opinions without fear of losing status or career. And in order for that to happen, we got to kind of set the stage. It needs to be clear that it's okay to speak up, right? And you have to see that when you speak up or when you disagree, there are no consequences to that. You have to invite people to do that, and you have to respond productively. If you think how hard it is to disagree with your boss or, or be, bring up a, a counter idea, if you do that, if you're bold and you're brave and you do it, and then you get slapped down, never going to do it again, right? So this is a process that has to be carefully thought out and it has to be supported. Psychological safety uh, is a prerequisite for radical candor. In order to be able to give receive, and receive feedback in the workplace, and this is supervisor to co employee or colleague and also laterally, colleague to colleague, you have to feel safe, right? You're not going to venture out there if it's not safe to do so. Being willing to disagree because you care is the greatest sign of respect you can show others. This is important work. 
We need to get everybody's best effort every day, and we need your thoughts, ideas, opinions in that mix in order to come up with it. You don't feel safe in sharing that if you withhold in a meeting your idea, and afterward, the meeting after the meeting, right? You had the meeting, then you had the meeting after the meeting. No meeting after the meeting. We want everybody to feel free to share at that point in time, but you have to feel safe to do that. All right, let's move on and talk just a little bit about radical candor, and then we're going to do a little exercise. Okay. I'm going to put on the I'm going to put on the accelerator. So radical candor. Anybody heard of this before? It's been in the literature for a little while. It's about four years old. No? Okay, this is fun to introduce something that's new then. So radical candor is a way of, of normalizing the giving of feedback in organizations. And this is just a little diagram about, uh, about how it can occur. And there's some like little fun words there in the non-radical candor squares, and we're going to talk more about those. So radical candor is really essentially saying what you think while caring about the person you're saying it to. This is very public healthy when you think about it, when you look at our at our qualities, right, and attributes. So why is feedback so hard for us? Because from a very early age, what were we told? If you can't say anything nice, don't say anything. And niceness did not come up as a cultural norm, but I'm going to add that to the list. Feedback, again, is both positive and developmental or critical. And there needs to be a ratio. You've got to have about seven positives to every developmental or constructive, for people to feel like every time you're talking to them, it's not with a criticism, right? Radical candor is, is a pretty popular model. It's been written about a lot in the business literature. It's also been misused a bit because, you know, some people will start off, you know, a sentence, well, in the spirit of radical candor, and then you're kind of like, oh, man, what's coming next, right? Not the way it was intended to be. Not the way. So let's talk for a second about caring personally and challenging directly. Caring personally is very simple. Golden rule. View supervisees and colleagues as human beings. We're all human beings. We're all people with feelings. And work is important. And it's a personal expression of our identity, right? We don't need a deep personal relationship with a person to have positive regard for them as a human being. So this isn't about who you like, who you don't like. It's like we're all human beings, and we deserve dignity and respect. And feedback needs to be given with those tenants in mind. Does that make sense, you guys? It would to us, because that's like pretty core to who we are. Challenge directly. Delivering praise and criticism in a caring and non-judgmental manner in a way that people can hear it. It's behaviorally focused. It's not using words like defensive, because do, do you ever like open up when somebody re uses that word in a conversation? You're like, OK, I'm just shutting right down. Not the way we want to do it. Behaviorally focused, with the goal of helping each other to do their best work. That is why we give feedback. Make sense? All right, you have these handouts on your table, too. Um, on the, the, the slide that I just let go a little bit too soon, on the radical candor side, there's like six sort of tenets about sort of how you do that. So people have to ask for feedback in order to normalize it. Is there anything I could do or stop doing that makes it easier for you to work with me? That's pretty innocuous, right? Like, you, you could respond to that question. You want to embrace feedback. When you ask for feedback, you create an uncomfortable situation for yourself and for the person you're asking. So you want to embrace that discomfort. You want to normalize it. You want to accept the fact that in order to get better, you need to hear what other people are thinking. That's sort of at the heart of that. You want to reward people that give you feedback. Treat initial feedback like gold, particularly criticism. Because if people feel comfortable enough with you to tell you, that's a valuable gift. Don't lose that. You want to thank people. You don't want to criticize the criticism. You don't want to try to justify why it happened. You want to listen to understand. You don't want to listen to dismiss it. And that's super hard. 
You have as good as you get. If you want people to give you feedback, then you're going to have to do it too. Rituals. Sometimes if you set up an opportunity for feedback to occur at the end of a meeting, one group used to pass around like a teddy bear and everybody gave some feedback at the end of the meeting. Or you could pass because, you know, it's not like this, you know, everyone doesn't need feedback 24 hours a day, right? But probably a little more than we're giving it now in our setting. All right, this last slide then, uh, before our exercise, is talking a little bit about the other quadrants of radical candor. And these are kind of fun, you know, because the names are kind of wacky, right? And we probably uh, receive feedback in all these quadrants. The other thing I want to say about this is there are times when you may intentionally choose to act in these quadrants, and it's not necessarily wrong. But understand what you're doing and why. That's, that's the purpose. And if you're operating too much, try to move over to, to the other quadrant. Obnoxious aggression, this is not super common in public health, except sometimes, you know, you get the governor's appointee that comes in and they start, like, throwing this stuff around. It becomes very clear that's not a part of the culture here. This is really brutal honesty or front stabbing. That's the, in the spirit of radical candor, and then you just dump it all out. That is feedback that is not honest, that's sometimes cruel, and that doesn't respect the human being. Ruinous empathy, this one's a little more common in public health. It's nice, but it's ultimately not helpful, and it can be damaging. It's praise that's not specific enough to help the person understand what was good, or criticism that's sugar-coated or unclear. How about that second one? That comes up a lot, doesn't it? Manipulative insincerity. That's when you care too much about yourself. It's in your best interest to be liked, so you're not going to go out on that limb and, um, and, and risk not being liked. And that, again, is putting your needs ahead of somebody else's needs. And also not thinking about how do we do our best work. Remember to praise. Praise shows people what success looks like. We humans excel when people who care about us tell us what they're experiencing and feeling. When we have a relationship, when we have trust, we can hear what you say. We can act on that because we trust you. We can do things differently, or we can do more about, of those things that we're doing so well. And that really contributes to our operational excellence and impact and outcome. Make sense? Okay. All right. Let's move on and let's do a little exercise to, to get the post-lunch. Here's a little case study. I am going to just flip to the next slide just to give you the instructions, then I'll flip back to this. You always see how you could reorder these uh, differently when you're doing the presentation. So what I want you guys to do is review the case, and then at your tables, work, um, and, and, the, and how many people do we have? You know, you can either break up into groups of th two, three, or if you've got a table of four, just all do it together, you know, whatever makes the most sense. Work with a partner and discuss how you might handle the conversation that needs to happen as a result of this case study, which you'll read in one second. Um, and, and how would you approach it with radical candor, obnoxious aggression, ruinous empathy, or manipulative insincerity? Consider how your existing organizational culture supports radical candor or one of the other components. And what could you do in your setting to promote caring personally and challenging directly? Does that make sense? Read the case. How would you answer it based on the four quadrants? How, how does your organization support or not support, and what would you do? I'm going to go back to the case now, um, maybe, if I can figure out how to do that. Hi. You're in charge of reviewing and approving all grant applications that are created by MCH program staff prior to submission to the funder. You have met with the grant writing team several times to clarify expectations regarding the approach, the process for completing the application, to assure a mutual understanding about the guidance and review criteria. Final application comes to you for review and approval. It's always at the last minute, right? 72 hours is probably even like a joke. This is like eight hours. Upon review, you'll find that the application lacks a clear overarching goal and purpose, is poorly organized, difficult to follow, is missing components specified in the review criteria. Therefore, you can't approve the application for submission, and you must have a conversation with the grant writer on your team. Is that clear? It hap has this happened to anybody? No? Yeah? Mm -hmm. yeah? Me too, Rachel. All right, go ahead, 
You're going to talk with each other about how you would respond, how you would craft this conversation in each of the four quadrants. How does your organizational culture support that? And then what are you going to do to promote more radical candor? So take about 10 minutes and discuss, and then we'll just get a few thoughts from each table. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't have to be super formal. Does that make sense to everybody? Let's, let's share some thoughts. Our, our, focus, our focus is on radical candor, but I would like to start out to get at least one example from each of the other three quadrants. Uh, that, was, that was probably the most fun in your discussions. So let's get, let's get an example um, of ruinous empathy, of manipulative insincerity, and of noxious uh, aggression, aggression. So can... can can somebody give us an example of, uh, from your table of ruinous empathy? Lip, we're running the mic so we can get your voices on camera. We're being filmed, if you did not know. So there, they're in the back. Uh, Cheryl, back there, yeah. So uh, what we discussed that might fall into that category is an approach that you take the as it's been presented, you uh, say to the person or the team, I know you did your best, and then you change it and submit it. So, so that you just, no real concrete feedback to them. Okay, several are shaking their heads. That was their discussion. How about an example of manipulative insincerity? All right, right. <laughs> I'm an expert in all of these, but this one I feel like I really have down. I'll tell you why. Because I feel like this is a perfect mix of obnoxious aggression and ruinous empathy. It's sort of both, Even right? Better. So I feel like I, in this situation, might get upset, be a little passive aggressive. Didn't we talk about this? Didn't we go over this? What did you not understand about how I told you to do this? And then I would take it from them and do it myself. So I think. I would be, that's what I would do. So I think it's kind of both mixed together a little bit. Like, you suck, and I don't care about helping you grow. Yeah. <laughs> in the, okay. But you should say, in the spirit of red. Yeah, <laughs> in the spirit of... <laughs> okay, how, thank you. So it's good to point out that these are not necessarily mutually exclusive. How about obnoxious aggression? An example? Sure, thank you. Seriously, this is crap. I have seen, this is awful. Oh, the budget, I guess, was okay, maybe. But you have got to go back to the drawing board. This is a piece of crap. I don't even know where to begin. Get back there, get to work, get it done. I expect something back in 24 hours. Okay. <laughs> and have people experienced that? Yes. All right, let's get some examples then of radical candor that, that you've discussed. Please, there must be some examples of... <laughs> yes, thank you. Radical candor? Yes. I think I, I said it to you earlier, is really start setting the stage for the employee when they come in to talk to you so you're not immediately offensively putting them on attack and saying, look, we're going to open up the communication here. This is not a personal uh, criticism on you. We got to work on this grant um, and do it a little better. So let's do it step by step. Tell me why you're thinking, what you're thinking under this particular item, and I'll tell you what the grant, what I'm thinking the grant is, and come into a mutual agreement on that. So this way you're not putting them on defense and you're not getting angry yourself. So, so I just, and Mona, let me just, Mona, right, is that it? Just uh, to elaborate a little further on the point that you made, that in, in your encounter you would say, I'm going to, you would start off and say, I'm going to share with you what's working here, and I'm going to share with you what's not working. That both of those pieces of information, both those kinds of information are helpful here. So that, that I think. Other examples, right over here. Uh, over here. Cheryl, yeah, thank you. Thank you. 
Um, our example was saying that you could say to the person, I was over, I was reviewing your application and I was unsure about this area and I wanted to just understand what your goal or purpose is. Can you please walk me through what you were thinking and then we can work from there because I think we can assume all day long why it's not meeting the goals, but if you don't really ask and get to the bottom of it and just assume, then they're gonna probably not be open to hearing your corrections. So before we, I just want to ask, that sounded a little on the, you know, ruinous empathy side to me. Uh, and, and again, the, you know, the, the boundaries are not clear. You know, like, I'm, I'm unsure, but, but you were sure. It sounded like you were sure that this was unacceptable. Or no, you weren't sure. Okay, fine. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> so I think that, that what you have shared is a great way to open the conversation, and I like what you said about clarifying assumptions, because again, even when we're like reading something against a set of, of criteria, I, I mean, think about it, if you've ever reviewed a grant, there's still a lot of subjectivity in it. So I like the fact that you give the person an opportunity to explain, and then, and, and you may have been going here, but I understand what you're saying. And then, based on that explanation, you know, there could, there's two paths, right? If they explain to you exactly what it is that isn't there, that's like a super win-win, right? You're like, okay, that great, now go write that. And then conversely, if they've missed the point, you can say, okay, I'm glad to understand the way you were thinking about it. Here's the way I'm reading it. So I think that's, it, it's a good way to get into that conversation and then you follow it up with either of the two paths. Because I think, several people brought this point up, the, the thing that needs not to happen, the person needs to own it and fix it. You don't. And to the people that said, you know, you say something to them and you go do it yourself, hey, man, I've been there. But that doesn't help the person learn and grow and remember mastery, right? So I, I think that you're, um, I, I like what you said about clarifying the assumptions. Is a question about this or you want to give us another? Okay, she had her hand up first, I'm sorry. I just wanted to add when she was speaking on that and also from the slides, it's really important too to just continue to say thank you during the whole entire conversation, but also point out the good parts that they've done great at and also refer back to previous applications. Um, and when they're giving you that feedback, allow them to point out their mistakes as well, what they think they may have you know, uh, done incorrectly, and just work together um, as a team on it. Okay, so. thank you. Six. So you had a comment? Yeah, I was going to just piggyback, and you pretty much I was going to mention um, is that the the manager who is looking over the grant application to give feedback has to believe in their uh, staff. They have to show that they believe in them and that they're capable of doing the work. That is a leader, that I am actually um, giving you this assignment, and I know you can do it. So as you said, really having them own it and then, you know, asking or putting it forth, you know, now that you got two sides of it, how, how are, now that you have two sides of it, you have your side and, and mine, um, I believe you can put this together. I believe you can pull things and, and make it work. Nice. And, that, and that's a heavy weight, and it carries a lot because then that employee then believes in themselves that they can do it, and that really just shows uh, teamwork too. Very well. That's caring personal. I think the point of the second bullet here, you had said that you had already met with them and assured mutual understanding. So there is obviously a, a inaccuracy there. There wasn't mutual understanding. So a piece of this could also be to, you know, a feedback to oneself that you didn't have mutual understanding. And so to be able to, when you meet with them to say, you know, I remember when we met, I mentioned this, you know, what, how did that land on you? What did you take away from that? So that when you're meeting with the next set of grant writing team, you don't use the same approach that people didn't understand the first time around. 
So Karen, I mean, you can say, so how could I explain this differently to you? Yeah. What, you know, what, what could I have done differently in our meetings so that we, we would have had a better understanding? Yeah. So to take some ownership yourself. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. I, I think, and again, that's caring for Right. Yeah, I think similarly, I think uh, the challenge is that people shouldn't be in this situation. Like, that um, it should not be a surprise to anybody for something where the stakes are high that at the last minute it's not where you need it to be. So I think that we take a step back because I think that happens a lot in our organizations and our agencies and a whole lot of people are working on things independently or with a small group and maybe they're working just above their comfort level which is a good thing but then they're not getting the support and there's a whole lot of assumption and a whole lot of internalized pressure of you know my program this need these people that I'm working for are so incredibly important that you will run yourself into the ground and then find out that that what you've been working on is not at all like towards what people thought you were. So I feel like it shouldn't, this should not happen nearly as often as it does. Can I say something yeah, about please. that? Uh, thanks so much for bringing that up. I, I couldn't agree more. And I think why this does happen as often as it does goes back to a lot of what we've covered in this slide set. It's the culture. It is our, and a lot of it's ruinous empathy. It is we're so afraid to tell someone directly something that they don't want to hear. Also gets a little bit into people first culture, not mission first people centered culture. So these are sometimes cultural norms. And again, it goes right into psychological safety and feedback, where if people were comfortable sharing feedback back and forth, then you might not get to this situation. And my second point is that this may happen as often as it does because the way it's being handled when it does happen are all the examples that we've talked about in this room, which does not lead to people um, having growth in mastery. This is not, that's not a learning situation when I write it or I just chew you out like Lynn was talking about. That doesn't make me grow and learn and do better next time. And then sometimes what we're seeing is just that continuing to play itself out. And again, you know, it's not kindness to not tell someone what everyone else is saying behind their back, right? Because you're like, oh, don't give it to them. Like, you know, they've written five grant applications. They've all been bad. They can't do it. Well, you know, that's not okay. But like, let's take some action that's going to help that person with mastery, right? I was just going to comment on that. Um, so who creates that culture? Who, um, that's the question. And that comes from um, upper management, um, even above the mid-level management. It's the, those at the top. So that is a responsibility of those individuals to create that uh, culture of safety you mentioned and culture of trust. And when it's not there, as you alluded, then that, that causes um, everything to have an effect on the work itself. Mm -hmm. But it comes from the top. Yeah. And one more, uh, just one more point about that. Thank you for bringing it up. And, and you have read into my future slides where I say you have the power to change the culture. It is much more difficult when you are trying to interject at your levels. But you can do a cultural change for MCH, even if you can't make it all the way up to the top. People can understand that this is the way we operate, and when I have to go out and I have to go to the uppers, I gotta be aware. People can, can get that. But you can still get so much richness out of your team by having a good, healthy work culture in your team that can help people sort of traverse that, that sort of, you know, inconsistent ground. Ideally, it comes from the top. But you know how it goes. Heads of our health departments, governor appointed. What's job one? Don't ruin my next job, right? So it's not like people are coming into our organizations thinking, how can this organization be the best it can possibly be? So that's on us, because we're the ones that are going to be there once they're gone, right? We be here before you come, and we be here when you go. So one more comment. Okay, my comment's a question, and I'm a little bit embarrassed about it because I'm afraid you all got it already, and I'm just getting it, okay? So radical candor, you care personally, 
you challenge directly, but you avoid using obnoxious aggression and all the rest of those. Is that what you're saying? Oh my God, somebody just come hit me. Okay. <laughs> for, uh, for a little bit, I thought you wanted us to use those things, and I was like, no. Thank you for the feedback, number one. That's good for me because I wasn't clear. And thank you for, for having the psychological safety to ask that question in this group. Yay! So um, you're absolutely right. The preferred way to uh, act is, is to use the radical candor frame. And a part of the model is sort of, you know, to have those sort of fun terms, you know, just to illustrate, you know, what, what is less effective in terms of our communications and interactions. But we're aiming for radical candor, caring personally, and um, challenging directly. Thank you so much for that clarification. And if I ever do this again, I'll be clearer. Appreciate it. So I probably, I probably confused that table, though, because I talked about having different tools in your toolbox. And depending on what outcome you want from your interaction, um, there may be reasons to use different approaches. So, especially if you need that person to cooperate with you for an end result, um, you need to think about how that person might take what you say and maybe do something that in the big picture might be um, counterproductive to what you need to get done. And that's a really good point. And that kind of goes back to you know, an, an earlier comment. There may be times when you intentionally are acting in those other boxes. And the point is, know that you're doing that. Know why you're doing that. Um, and hopefully, that's not your MO, right? Does that make sense? OK. Great. Let's move on. We have one more exercise, and then we'll take a little break. Okay, whoops. All right. So just in summary, sort of this segment, healthy work culture results in impact when we have all of these things we've talked about. Clarity, consistency, trust, purpose, autonomy, mastery, diversity, cognitive diversity and inclusion, safety, feedback, skilled leadership and management. And, and a lot of emphasis on the management. We undervalue management in MCH. There's nothing wrong with management. It's, it's actually a great thing. All right. Again, you have the power to create a healthy work culture in your organizations, where you sit at your levels. You can do this. To that end, our next exercise, and again, I apologize. You know, we're a little short on the handouts. Again, we were going against the feds, and we are so glad to see all of you here. Thank you so much. So we were thinking, we're not going to have that many people, but we're really excited to see everybody that joined us today. Characteristics of cohesive leadership teams, and please go ahead and share. And then our final exercise is, what time is it? I might change these instructions. Okay. Okay. So take a few minutes by yourself, and like this is like two minutes to look at the characteristics on that sheet. And if you're sharing with somebody else, you know, you, you can look at it with your partner. Think about one of your teams. You know, the good thing about public health is collaboration, right? So you're probably all on a bunch of teams. Identify two characteristics that are and are not present. And then think like, hmm, why do we do it that way or why don't we? How do your team functions reflect your culture? Because a lot of times, how you do things in your team is really reflective of your larger organizational culture. And then what might you do differently um, with this team when you go home? So that's like about two, three, four minutes work by yourself for a minute. And then we'll just do a table discussion. And at that table discussion, just talk a little bit about what struck you what you see in your teams and what you don't, and what you might do when you go home. And then if somebody wants to jot a few notes, or it's been working well enough for people just to raise their hand and give some points. Yeah, Lynn. Oh, OK. Dev, uh, we'll, go, we'll, we will, uh, we'll get you some. Sorry. Is, is everybody clear on the instruction? Does that make sense? Let's, let's go from table to table, and let's hear some examples of two characteristics that are and are not present in your current team 
and why or why not. So who, who would like to start on that? Characteristics that are or are not on your current team. Be bold, right here. So we have two different states here, but we okay. just kind of put our heads together and talked about what we came up with. So one of the things we talked about was um, that is not present is there's not a true vulnerability in the group in our groups. Um, one thing that is present is there's a deep passion and commitment to the families and kids we serve. We're all CYSHCN up okay. here. Um, one of the things that came out is that there's um, kind of so much territorialism that we come together as a group and we may be really passionate, but we're so afraid of like our funding being infringed upon or you know not being able to do the things that we want to do that we kind of hold back on working together. That was a little bit what came from Kentucky, it, Kentucky, right? Um, for me, I'm thinking about my team and we're, we're all um, in our program, you know, we do newborn screening, we have some state funding, we have our block grant funding. We're all kind of off in different directions doing our own thing. We're good at coming together as a team and being cohesive and getting along and having fun. We're, we're not as good as like actually giving, actually giving each other constructive feedback mm. and really helping each other grow um, professionally, I guess. So. Okay. So um, a lot of these topics on the project team that I work on, I, um, I'm at an organization that does training and technical assistance, and I work with a lot of colleagues that are uh, work in different offices. And the, so I, a lot of these, I feel like, okay, we, we, we are using, we are doing this, this, I recognize this in our team. But the one that I think we could use some work on is the one on the team has agreed upon and embraced small specific of, uh, and specific set of behavioral values. And I, I interpret it as that as act, things like showing up to meetings on time, um, not, Avoiding multitasking. Um, if we choose as a group to use video conference, everybody doing that, no matter what your hair looks like. And <laughs> like, um, and then Christina brought up another value being like, no, even this one would be a tough one, but no cell phones in yeah. meetings. And really showing each other we value our time together and we're here, we're present. So that's an opportunity I'd like to work on with our team. Uh, may I just ask a show of hands, so how many are in teams where uh, it is clear at the outset we want you to put your cell phone away so that we can all be present? Is that, so that's, that's made a clear norm? It, that's, that's great, just a couple. Just a couple have raised your hands, and others it's not. Is that, is that what I'm hearing? Okay. Okay, other, other thoughts on uh, characteristics that are or are not in your teams? We kind of went selfish and we started talking about our team because I was sitting there going through the checklist and I'm like, no, 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 no. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, we've got to work because we are part of West Texas and it takes me eight hours to get to my, one of my sites. Um, so we've got one or two people there. So how do we deal with it when we do come together? They're very good about the having fun and getting along together, but when we start talking about our deliverables and measures and what we need to get done, it seems like they go another tangent somewhere else. And how do we fix that? And how do we do that? And um, that's kind of, I am gonna give up a little secret at this moment, because I think it, we were supposed to be in another session, we thought, in here, and you guys started talking workforce development, and I'm looking at her going, are we in the right place? Then you started talking about probationary time, and I'm like, I think God wanted us here. Now I want God to heal you. May I follow up with a quick question? Um, so how many of you on your teams spend some time, it might be just one or two minutes, at the end of a meeting talking about what worked and what didn't work in the meeting? Is that, is that a common practice or not? So a few of you are, okay, so that, that's a good practice. Uh, there was a, another thought over here. And let me interject yeah, something yes. just really quick to, to your point. 
So, you know, the, these are little snippets. You know, I've pulled these from a variety of resources. If you want to dig deeper into this, there's a really nice book. It's on the reference list. It's called The, uh, the, uh, oh, what's, uh, now I'm blind. the Advantage, yeah, thanks, like all my hand up, um, by Lynn Sioni. They, they walk you through this process of clarification, setting up clarity and expectations in, at thetablegroup.com. It's on the last slide. There's a ton of free tools. So if you're really interested in this, super readable. It's not that hard. I just did it cold with my team. I, you know, I'm like, okay, I'm going to try this. And um, it's a real nice guide. The advantage, yeah. It's like um, 10 bucks at Amazon. First all, just FYI, I took a picture of the list, so that's why I'm holding my phone, so I'm not or anything like that, okay? Um, our team, it, it's very clear we're all very passionate and we have the same goal. It's the kids in our program and it's best for them. Um, where we run into a little trouble is um, part of our team is held accountable and responsible for the assignments that we leave with. And then there's other members, not so much. And that's really frustrating when you come back together and we did our part, but this person and that person didn't. And so we're still at the same place as we were the last meeting because we can't move forward yet. Have you ever used a document called a team charter for your team? Is that familiar to some people? Yes. That spells out the accountability mechanism, but to your point, then the accountability sort of comes down to whomever's leading or who chartered that team, because most teams also have executive sponsor, who then is responsible for that accountability piece. But spelling that all out on the front end sometimes it will help. But then someone's got to bring it up, right? So there has to be the safety for someone to say, hey, so-and-so, yep. you don't have your, your work, and we need it for this meeting today. So, But excellent point. Yeah, that's a hard one. We'd like to take a break at 3. Uh, we welcome at this point other comments about the teams or if you have other questions for Karen uh, about uh, points that have been raised at the, um, so far in the workshop, we welcome that as well. So kind of open mic at this point. Can I say one thing about the handout? Um, I, I told people it was in your app, but only one um, copy is in your app. So um, Karen is going to send um, a bunch of them to me. I'll put them together in a writer. and then you know, post it hopefully in the app, or you can leave your email address at my um, at my desk up front, <laughs> and then we'll get them to you. Yeah, no, I'm happy. Uh, uh, please. Centric part of it. Yeah, that and it's an interesting phrase, isn't it? And I think that, um, and, and this does go kind of back to culture. It makes it sound like I'm, so, you know, like I'm talking about, hey, people are our greatest assets, and I'm like, but no, people first cultures. That the point that um, I'm trying to make is that um, our, our people are our greatest asset, and we're all coming together for a purpose, and our purpose is to drive the mission. So we want our people to feel uh, trusted and respected and fully empowered to work in service of the mission. Sometimes what happens in people first culture is that things get taken a little bit too far afield from the mission to address individuals personal needs that really don't have much to do with the mission. That can sometimes be a characteristic of a toxic work culture. So I recently did a little consulting project in my old agency where I did a little assessment of a, of a programmatic branch that had, this is where I came up with this kind of notion. Because when I was interviewing, some, doing some key informant interviews, and we were talking about focusing people on the mission, one of, one of the people said to me, so I've had to come to the understanding that we are now mission first, not people first. And I was like, what the heck does that mean? <laughs> but she, her point was, I'm used to doing whatever feels good to me that makes my life the easiest, sort of mission be damned, if you will. And now I have to row in the same direction as everybody else in service of the mission. But it's also not permission to not be respectful, 
and considering the best interests of our employees to move things forward because that is the, that's, the, that's the underpinning of engagement, right? Does that, does that help? Thanks. Other questions, comments? I'm thinking to that end, um, I've been with our program a little over two years and it was clear when I came in that we had one of the people that you were describing back there <laughs> who every time would not have the work done and would, and everybody knew it. I mean, everybody, if, we, if I asked everybody in our agency who never gets their work done, I know they know who that is. And so recently, and, and I'm curious if you think this is the right step, for, for right now I think I, I was brilliant, um, which is <laughs> <laughs> that I just gave her a calendar and I said on this date this is what you need to have done, on this date this is what you need to have done, and I couldn't believe I was doing it and I gave it to her and she's like, oh my god, I've needed this for years. I can't believe this, this is so wow. great. And I was like, you know what, if it gets the mission done, Let's just, I'll do it, because now we're not, you know, she can finally join the rest of us in getting things done on time, and, and so it was for the mission, even though it was for the, per, you know, adapting to the person's needs. That's, that's a great example of mission first, people centric. It's also a great example of what someone said earlier about, you know, like stepping away from your assumptions and really sort of going through, okay, what, you know, what's the, what's the nature of this issue and then how can it be solved? Because, you know, when these things have gone on for months or years, you know how a story gets built, well, <laughs> they just never do, you know, that whole thing. But, you know, has anyone really picked that apart? Like, what are the issues? You know, it could be something as simple as somebody just can't, keep that and they and maybe and they can probably do it now but they just never thought to write that down so I think you were brilliant congratulations a, a, some feedback that I, I would like from you on a, a technique I guess we've recently implemented okay so we've had um, we probation period the person passed it but you know let's move forward three or four years and things aren't so great and you've done sensitivity training, you've done um, cultural diversity training, and you're still getting nowhere. You've done discipline plans. Um, and it's not bad enough that you, want, you should let the person go, and that would take probably one or two years in our civil service system. So the thought was move the person, lateral move, out of where they're at, but something that's more personalized to their skill set. Um, so what do you think of that when you think, I, I mean, in a way we're, we're doing mission first because we see the person is kind of causing a toxic environment, um, but yet we're making it a personal thing it, or not, a, you know what I mean, doing what do you understand what I'm saying? Um, I have lived it. I get it. I totally get it. Yeah. Um, so I have a couple of thoughts. And of course, you know, I don't know the entire situation. And, I, and believe me, I know how hard it is to release people. Dorothy and Lou and I were just talking about this over lunch. Here's what I would say. Uh, I think that, you know, you, you sort of have to make the first assessment. Is this person, is this person just not going to be successful? One, one thing I'm going to throw out, this, may, this could be a bias of mine. When has training ever corrected someone who's an underperformer? But it's what we always go to first, right? For the most part, but you know, it's something to do, right? I'm not saying don't do it, but I'm saying that it's, you know, it's usually not, it usually doesn't solve the problem. So I would say make that assessment about where they're at. Then secondly, I think this question about reskilling people, there was a really great article in Fast Company Magazine last week about this reskilling. And if you are not getting Fast Company Magazine, you guys got to get on it. It's like fantastic. And the Lighthouse blog is another one. They just had a whole blog post this weekend about uh, onboarding. I know you're looking at me like I am insane, but I read this stuff for fun, right? I don't even like work at the state anymore. So what I would say is, I think you need to make the determination: Can this person be reskilled, and then reskilled into what skill set? Because what you're looking for is success. Now I'm going to take issue with your question: It's not bad enough to let them go. 
is, really? I mean, it is bad enough to let them go. And I think even if it's going to take one to two years, and believe me, I have done it, and your life is just a living hell during that time period. I am not taking it lightly, and nor do I like fire everyone on the planet, but I have taken it on when it needed to happen. You know, if you're already three to four is into it, if it takes one to two years, if you would have started, you would have been through it. So I really think you ask yourself the deep question if it just needs to end. And then put that process in place. And I know how, you guys, I know, I have been there. I've been in court. I have been the subject of a 23-page single-space manifesto by someone who posted it online. I mean, it, like, there's a lot of weird stuff out there, right? So I'm, I'm not taking it lightly. I am not taking it lightly. Thank you for raising that question. You're awesome. You have, like, asked a bunch of really great questions. All right, we should break. I think, yes. Uh, uh, so let's say thank you to Karen. Thank you, guys. We're going to take a 10-minute break, and when we come back, uh, uh, Dorothy Salenti is going to discuss with us, in the context of this culture, how do we systematically plan and execute MCH initiatives? So I'm excited about that. And we also have some high-quality chocolate that will be available to you when you return from the break. Uh, before I turn the microphone over to Dorothy Salenti, I would just like to mention that uh, the National MCH Workforce Development Center, for which we are affiliated, uh, welcomes the opportunity to work with state teams about uh, challenges, health transformation challenges, complex challenges. Uh, we have a, a table in the exhibition hall and many of us will be around over the course of the AMCHIP meeting, so we welcome the opportunity to speak with you uh, about some of the possible uh, uh, projects, challenges that you would like to, uh, to bring to the center. Uh, we've got a lot of enthusiastic fans among state Title V teams who would vouch for the value of the interaction with the center. So uh, the National MCH Workforce Development Center is a wonderful opportunity. Uh, to, uh, to acquire some skills uh, and to make a real difference, uh, an additional difference, on top of all the hard work that you're doing in your state. So that is my uh, PSA for the Workforce Center, and now Dorothy Salenti. <laughs> hey, good afternoon, everyone. Let's thank Lou for the snacks. Yay, Lou. <laughs> Nothing like, <laughs> nothing like a little sugar at 3 in the afternoon on a Saturday. Um, so I'm glad to be here. Um, I'm going to be talking uh, about running lean. And this isn't about physically running and getting lean. It's about running your organizations in a lean way. Um, but basically, we heard Karen talk about, um, during the first part of this uh, session, how to use your uh, people resources in a way to get the best results, both for them and for the organization, um, which is really important. But you also need to um, make sure that what they're doing and what you're implementing is really uh, the right work that they need to be doing. So you need to do the right work in the right way to get the right results. So I'm gonna be talking about how to figure out what the right work is and then how to plan in a systematic way so that you can be successful. So Running Lean is, um, I have a copy by Ash Moira. It's basically uh, describing an organizational process to plan and execute initiatives. Now it is from the business sector, so a lot of the language is very private sector business oriented. But when I read it, I felt like there were a lot of principles and uh, tools and concepts that I think we in public health, particular, particularly governmental public health, can apply um, and learn from. Um, so again, this uh, method is to test several ideas that you might have, um, and then to think systematically about how to implement those ideas successfully. So you have an example of the tool that I'm gonna walk us through in the next hour, um, and just know that you would use this tool to vet various ideas that you might have, and then 
um, compare them on the different criteria. And I share with people that we use this to a similar tool when we were conceptualizing the Workforce Development Center because we were basically starting from scratch. We knew generally what the um, intent of uh, HRSA was with the Workforce Development Center, but we really weren't sure exactly um, what kind of model we were going to put together. So this was a really useful tool uh, for us to work as a team collectively to design um, something that we thought would be responsive to our customers, who are you, Title V practitioners, and your partners. Um, so, this um, running lean, as I said, it's a systematic process to iterate from your plan that you have to a plan that ultimately will work. And you want to do this before you tap out of your resources. Um, it's about speed, it's about doing things quickly, learning, improving, and then maintaining focus on the end goal. Um, it also tests your vision. I shared with someone uh, earlier that I have lots of ideas. I could come up with ideas all day long, um, but I make certain assumptions, and then there's always the execution, right? So how do you move from your ideas and your vision to actual execution of the best strategies? Um, and it's also a good process to engage your stakeholders because it provides a framework for you to have discussions about what are the most important components for you to consider. So um, the map in front of you, it's a road map. Basically, um, it's important for you to understand that you may have an initial vision about what you'd like to see in your future state for your maternal and child health populations, but it's, it's fundamentally based on your mental models and your assumptions. So this is a way to systematically test and refine your vision. And the first thing to do is to document what your vision is. So um, writing down your initial vision and then sharing it with somebody else or your team. Um, and then you don't have to come up with the best solution right away, but you want to come up with something that's going to fit given your goals and your context and the um, health changes that you'd like to see in your population. So document your plan is the first part of this process, and that's why I gave you the one-page template to work on. Um, also, if you believe that people are able to solve their own problems, they're going to be more interested in um, taking up what you're proposing and delivering. So your biggest risk, and this plan helps you identify that, is understanding um, whether what you're developing is actually going to be utilized by the people you're trying to um, provide it to. And your biggest risk then is that nobody's going to want what you develop. And I was thinking about um, both market, building your product, what are you trying to deliver, and then matching it to your market. And I'm sure you've all gotten those robocalls where it's, it's not in English. It's somebody else speaking a different language. They don't know if you have the ability to understand them or not, but they're leaving you this message about some product that they're going to try to sell you. And it's totally not a fit because they don't understand what your preferred language is, right, and what you're going to understand. So let's not waste time and resources in creating things that people can't use or don't find um, helpful. Um, and then thirdly, you need to figure out if the problem you're trying to address is worth, so is worth solving. So for us in public health, maternal and child health, we really can't be doing any more important work. Like we know that all of the problems that we're trying to work on are really critically important to the well-being of families and communities in our country. So we have that to our advantage, that what we work on is highly valued, it's highly important, and it's worth solving. And so we get up every day, and we try different approaches, and we try to bring people on board, and we um, you know, work really hard at something that's really, really important. So we don't have to question that, really. But we do have to convince other people that it's really important that we work on these issues, because there are lots of priorities. So we'll talk a little bit about um, proposing our value to others and why our um, problems are really important to solve. And then we ask, do we have a solution? Is there something feasible out there that we can do? Is there good evidence that it's going to work? And we just did a session this morning on using evidence to implement improvements. And um, a lot of what we do in public health is well researched. We are founded on uh, science. We have a scientific basis for the work we do. So we have that in our court as well. We're not just, um, you know, shooting from the hip and trying to see if something's going to make a situation better. Um, 
But there are risks in implementing our solutions. Sometimes they're not politically um, supported. Sometimes um, we may not have the resources. Uh, sometimes they worsen disparities, right? We notice that we see improvements in overall mortality rates for maternal mortality, but then we drill down and we see that certain groups are doing worse while others are doing better, and then we're seeing a um, decrease in the gap. So this all involves testing and learning and being ready to pivot so that at the point that you're able to take advantage of an opportunity, you have the people and the resources in place to actually move on that opportunity and then change your course of action if that's um, what needs to happen. So just as a reminder, waste is any human activity which absorbs resources but creates no value. So anything you do is creating an opportunity cost somewhere else because you're not present to do both things at the same time or you don't have the resources. So you need to make the choice that what you're gonna choose to do is gonna be the thing that brings the most value, however you define that. Does that make sense? Okay, so let's move then on to creating this lean canvas. So you're um, thinking about what am I, what are we gonna use all this money for opioid prevention to do? Like what's, what's gonna help with uh, substance exposed infants and opioids? Or that's just one example. Or what are we gonna do about this increasing problem we have among LGBTQ youth and suicide? Um, you know, so you start understanding which problems are important to solve. Um, and then you want to use a process to work through what you think might be potential solutions. So this is a one-page diagram um, that was developed instead of a 50-page you know, business plan. And it's a fast way to get your ideas on paper and um, ex describe your vision for the problems that you're trying to address. Brainstorm possible strategies. Um, and set some priorities. It takes a snapshot of what's in your head at the time or what your team is thinking about. You may not be able to fill all the sections out, which is fine, um, but you want to be in the present, you want to be as detailed as possible, and you want to think about your customers. And we're going to talk more about the customer-centric approach. So everybody grab one of these um, at your table. I want to make sure everyone has one. And um, go ahead and cross out the date. I meant to take that off. You, you would put your own date. You would put your problem, your challenge that you're working on. And then you would keep track of versions for version control. Basically, um, this is going to help you deconstruct your solution and your implementation plan into these nine distinct categories. Um, and then we'll talk about how you'll have one of these for each of your ideas, and then you can look at criteria to determine what's um, the most feasible, the least risk going forward. So what we're going to do first is we're going to talk about problem and customer segments. So this is really challenging in public health, I think, um, to identify your customers because you have different levels of customers um, depending on what your initiative is. You might deliver some direct services, so it's pretty clear who the at the top of the pyramid who the recipients are, the intended beneficiaries, um, or you may do some wraparound case management services at the second level. So again, it's kind of clear who your beneficiaries are. But as you get to more population level interventions um, and you talk about the infrastructure, the lowest part of the pyramid, your customers or your audience changes. And it's important to be clear about who is the intended audience, because you can't develop a solution or an innovation or um, an intervention if you're not clear who the intended beneficiary is or who the recipients are. So what we'll do is we'll think about, um, think about for a few minutes in your head, what are your um, top one to three priorities in your current um, organization? Or state. So you can certainly think about your um, block grant action plan and those things that you've prioritized as a place to start. Okay, um, and then think about for the customer segment, what are the problems that they need to solve related to what you're trying to work on? Um, 
and in the business sector, they say, okay, what jobs do customers need done? So technology has done this really well. You've seen the advancements in technology um, over the last couple of decades. And your mobile phones are a good example of basically your personal computer that you carry around with you. And you can, probably many of you can remember when we had these huge desktop computers you know, that we had to get to in order to get information from. So think about for your population or your customers, what are some of the problems that they need solved? Um, and come up with one to three and put that in your first box there. So the purple, top three problems. And then I want you to just find a partner and share with them what you've identified as your top one to three problems for the customers that you're intending to serve. So again, list the top one to three problems for your population of interest. And then on the bottom of that problem box, write down how people are currently solving that problem for themselves. So people work around their problems. They're very creative. They identify how to fix something. It may not be the best solution, but they have some mechanism by which they're taking care of their problem. Put that in that box as well, in that first box. In the problem box. So in the problem box, bullet your top one, two, three problems. And then underneath, put how people are solving those problems currently. It could be. So to go back to the example about um, the issue you're trying to address with opioid addiction in your state. What are the one to three problems that the population affected by that particular challenge is, is dealing with? Like, can they get access to treatment? Um, are they living in communities where there's um, no jobs and a lot of drug dealing? Um, what, what's the nature of the problems that they're encountering that impact your priority around reducing um, deaths related to opioid overdose. Does that make sense? OK, I want to hear some from groups about what type of problems you're thinking about. Any volunteers? Hello? Hello, everyone. Let's just share some of the problems. Here's someone in the back. Here, here. If no one's raising their hand, you can always count on me. Um, I talked about um, kind of reaching families and isolation of families with children needs with special health care needs. Do you want us to share what people are doing too? Just the problem Just box. the problems. Okay, and then the other one I talked about was access to quality specialty care. Okay, so for children and youth with special health care needs. So your overall um, priority or concern is related to um, children with special health care needs, systems of care. Okay. Yes. So uh, I also had something similar in the sense of reaching the most vulnerable or at risk women, um, and then creating healthcare settings that are aware of their implicit bias and addressing it, and then defining or finding value in the well woman visit preconception care for the consumer. Mm -hmm. else? Let's take one more. So I kind of went with your suggestion about opiates because Oklahoma is big with uh, opiate um, situation and problem and I think our uh, three top problems are uh, limited access to treatment centers um, because they don't we don't have a lot of them and so um, 
also lack of support uh, system, uh, their individual support system around them to even support them to try to get off of drugs. All right, and um, <clears throat> then um, daycare is one of them as well because you don't have anybody that will watch the kids while you actually go into, say, if it was a 30-day treatment center or something of that sort, so. Thank you, thank you. Good, good examples. Um, thanks. I think um, in thinking about then the problems that you put in that box, let's go over to the customer segments and your target population and think um, granularly, I guess, about who your customer might be with respect to the problems you've identified. So if you were preparing a solution for a, seg a segment of the population, who would that segment be? And these would be the people who basically need the problem solved that you've listed. And then within your customer segments, think about who your early adopters might be. So often we try to reach everybody with the same solution, and sometimes um, it's better to think about people who might be more ready to adopt what you've proposed. So who might those early adopters be? Who needs more time? Is everyone pretty good? OK, so right now in your Lean Canvas, you should have your um, top one to three problems, and the customer segments or the target audience that you would be particularly interested in addressing their problems that you've identified. Does everyone feel pretty good about that? Let me know if you're struggling with that at this point, because it makes the rest of the canvas hard if you haven't figured that out. Yes, in the back. Yeah, so if you want to do a lean canvas to address some priority, organizational priority, and your staff is your customer and they have one to three problems that you want to address, that's fine. Just as long as you're clear about who's the target audience and what are the problems. Um, for the purposes of this lean canvas, you want to focus on a customer segment. Ultimately, addressing the problems of your staff will maybe improve their performance, which would ultimately impact services for kids, which is great, but you don't need to have all of that on this plan. Those are good questions. Any other questions? Okay, I'm, I'm going to move us along then to the unique value proposition. How many people have worked with this unique value proposition um, principle before? So it's a little bit challenging, but it's basically um, something that we have borrowed from the business world and public health. Um, and it's about demonstrating our value. If you invest in us, what will you get from ret the return? and how you communicate that value to others. Um, so is there anything that people uh, feel like sharing at this point about things that they've tried to communicate value and whether that's been successful or not in terms of your um, MCH programs and services? So with us, um, I was just thinking of my, my customers or whatever, and uh, I'm, I'm a part of Healthy Start, so um, that kind of gives you who you're trying to get off drugs, which is moms and all of that. Um, I think one of the things that makes us unique and why we would probably appeal, appeal to uh, the customer is that we do effective case management which means that we're helping them work through their situations and problems all together, and that's like giving them and helping them with the resources, and not that we're just giving it to them, but we're actually going, uh, using the philosophy of if we, you know, you, you feed them for a day, they only eat a day, but if you teach them how to be self-sufficient, then you're doing something for a lifetime, so 
that would be some of the things that we could offer uh, to them, not to, to leave them by themselves, but to kind of walk through it with them um, and provide them some of the resources that they, they may need to help them sustain um, getting off drugs. Great. So that's a unique value of their Healthy Start program, that they've been able to successfully communicate to the recipients, and um, then the recip recipients will um, utilize their program or their services and hopefully have a great experience and tell other people about it, right? Exactly. Great. Um, so a value proposition then is that it's a promise of value. What will the customer get if they choose us? So in a lot of our um, customer segments, they don't necessarily choose us, but we still um, want to deliver high quality, high value services. Um, in some states, they may have more options than other states. It depends on, um, from a direct service perspective, what's available in their communities. But regardless of whether they have a choice um, or not, we want to still assure that the value that they receive from us is um, high quality and meeting their needs. Um, but sometimes we don't know how to describe that product or value. Sometimes it's just, oh, we're the safety net, we're the government. Um, but we need to be able to clearly say who we are, what value we bring, what's the product or the service, and why would our partners want to engage with us, particularly in these multi-sector initiatives where we may be working with other um, stakeholders to address a particular problem. So you need to ensure that everyone in your agency is clear and consistent about communicating value. Um, and it's not necessarily what's on our website or what's in our um, elevator speech, but it's um, clearly um, directed at the user or the intended beneficiary. And I'm going to talk to you through a little bit about how we um, go ahead and structure those value propositions. Maybe. I get froze that. Okay, so here's an example of one that um, was developed at another um, learning session that we did. And this basically says, um, okay, so who is the recipient of your service? Who's going to benefit? So this says for children who have special health care needs. So we understand who the customer segment is. Uh, we provide care coordination. So that was the example that was just given about the Healthy Start program. We're a high quality case management program or we provide high quality care coordination that makes the lives of these children better so they can um, have optimal lives and that we are then the one-stop shop as the Title V care coordination program that brings happiness and health to families. So this is one example of a value proposition. Um, what I'd like you to do is to take a few minutes and try to structure a value proposition for your organization or your service system um, re related to the customers that you've identified and the problems that they're currently trying to solve. So take a few minutes, um, and then we'll do some sharing with each other. Okay, so this is an example. Sorry, I didn't realize it wasn't projecting. It was um, frozen. But this is an example of what I just read to you of a good value proposition. And as you construct your own uh, value propositions, make sure they're easy to understand, that there's a communication of what the result is going to be for the customer, the intended beneficiary. Um, state how you're better than the competitor, and then don't use hype, like we're amazing, miracle product, or we value add, or we're the best. Just try to be transparent and genuine. Um, and again, there's a difference between the value proposition for your agency and your service. So think about it in terms of um, what you're delivering. OK, does anyone want to share their unique value proposition with the group? Ironically, mine is about care coordination, too, like the example you gave. So um, what I said about our staff, we have um, highly competent 
staff of nurses and social workers, knowledgeable of the healthcare systems in which they work. Um, and families, we actually poll our families. So families state our work improves the lives of their children. Nice. So, and we have data to support that through our um, statewide uh, family or parent survey. Right, so that kind of a statement might make you feel like, wow, that's, that's really validating. I think I want to be part of that program, right? I mean, that's basically what you want to instill in people. How about another one? Um, I'm the lead for youth health transition in our state. And for families who have teens with special health care needs, we teach you the skills to safely and smoothly go through the process of moving from pediatric to adult health care so your young adult can stay healthy and enjoy their lives as an adult. Very nice. Good. One more. Nobody wants to share theirs? They're hard to come up with. Oh, yours is an internal one, so that might be interesting to hear. Um, improve the quality of care coordination efforts to help children and youth with special health care needs and their families partner and connect with community resource, resources and providers through the use of our comprehensive assessment and person-centered plan. Our, our problem is getting staff's buy-in on the comprehensive assessment and person-centered plan. So that would be maybe an attractive value proposition yeah. to people who are trying to get to work in your program even. Right, that's what it, it, exactly. Trying to get our staff to understand that the end result of this is gonna be higher quality care, course, care coordination, in-depth assessment of these families where we can help them in several I don't know, areas of their lives instead of just the medical treatment uh, child or understanding that. Great. So you all know on your canvas there's a place for you to put your unique value proposition, so make sure you've written that in there on that plan. Okay, so basically we've um, thought about our customers, we've thought about what problems they're trying to solve, We've thought about how um, our services are unique. And now we're going to talk about generating some solutions. So solution possibilities. Um, start with the least complicated thing that you can do to address the problem. I think sometimes we um, you know, have s these complex um, innovations or program designs, and then it's really hard to monitor what is actually having the impact. Um, and make corrections. The one thing that um, seems to be most significant in having solutions that don't necessarily work is that we don't really get them to the customers or the desired audience. So um, in, this, in this Running Lean book, they recommend that you actually do a customer discovery and interview process as a way to understand um, which channels or methods are going to be most effective to reach the people you're trying to reach. Um, and it also gives you an idea of, you know, the extent to which this problem is really um, creating challenges for these customers and how much of a problem is it, meaning are they really going to be open to desiring a solution. Um, so go ahead on your, um, your canvas and generate a few simple solutions that you think might be effective and then they don't have to be fully defined, but also how would you actually reach your targeted audience or your segment, your customer segment. Okay, let's come back together. It sounds like you guys are having a great conversation. Um, can we hear from a few people about what you identified as some potential solutions for the problems and how you were going to reach your customers? Now it gets really quiet. Who wants to share? I hate to call on Rachel again. Anybody else want to share? No, we want to hear you from Okay. 
Oh, yeah, thanks. Um, so, um, solution thing for the assessment is um, pulling a group of our staff throughout the state. We have got, you know, care coordinators, program coordinator assistants, and regional managers. So, we take a group of them and they basically created our comprehensive assessment, okay? Lots of reviewing, lots of tweaking, but it was our staff who created it, okay? Very in-depth, much different than anything we've ever done before. Then we trained our staff on, on the document. Um, we also got an outside person to come in and teach our staff about motivational interviewing because that was one of the biggest complaints. Even from our social workers, you know, they didn't feel equipped to be asking families these kinds of questions. So we were trying to teach them um, this technique to help them feel more comfortable and it was an excellent training. Very, very, very good. So, and then, um, the other thing was increasing our staff. So that's a hot topic because um, our core program, you know, care coordinators were at a, between anywhere between 120, 145 caseload size. And the goal was to get it down to 75 per care coordinator. Um, and we're almost there. We haven't implemented the assessment yet, but they still think that's too many. And um, the things, the feedback we're getting is we're setting them up for failure. Um, the, the staff and managers say we're setting them up for failure to have these high expectations. What we're saying to them is we need you to try this. We're trying it. We're not, we're not setting any, any requirements right now. Like we're not saying you have to have your whole caseload done in six months, no. We want you to work through this, see how it goes, let's look at it again in three months and get your feedback. Um, so nothing's set in stone, we just want them to try it. But they're still really hung up on that number 75. Now, a little more information is we have another program, our home care program, and they've implemented it a year ago, the comprehensive assessment. They've we've tweaked it with them, but their caseload size is 25. So one program, 75. The other program, which manages complex, medically fragile children who require nursing in the home, 25. So that's a lot of contention. That's the biggest contention. But we, you know, we have this amount of money, here's our budget, here's what we can afford, let's see how it goes is what we're trying to get. And it's been pretty hard. And that's where we're at right now. We're starting to um, implement the actual training of the actual assessment. Starts in mid-March, working through the end of April. So anyhow. Great. Well, that's a, that's a good segue into the next um, two boxes about revenue and costs. Thank you for sharing that. Um, so these two boxes basically describe whether what you're proposing is viable. Um, the revenue streams and cost structure inputs calculate your break-even point. So when you're thinking about how many families um, does each staff member need to provide care coordination or case management services to, you also need to think about the financial aspects. So um, if we have so much in revenue, and we need to serve so many families, then we can come up with a cost per family that then we'll calculate into a caseload, basically, for each staff person, depending on how many staff people you have. So for example, um, here, what is it gonna cost you to build and launch your program if you were starting from scratch? Um, or what might it cost you to serve 200 families annually? and can you generate enough revenue to sustain your program? So these two boxes are useful um, both to model launching a new innovation, new program, but then also to determine sustainability over time. And you want to always make sure that you're doing enough, you're delivering enough value so that you're justifying your customer's um, involvement with your program. So in addition to looking at measures that um, 
describe the quality and the service and the results for the intended beneficiaries, you're also looking at your cost calculations. And so when you think about um, your revenue for your program, you're thinking about is it grant funding? Um, are there fees that I can collect? Um, is there um, payments from third-party payers that would support this program? Um, is it foundation funding? Is it block grant funding? So you need to have an idea of how much money you have to work with. And then you also have to have an idea of what your cost is. So most of our cost is always personnel related, right? That's where we spend most of our money. Um, so then recognizing how many people you have to serve and how much revenue you have, that sometimes helps you back into your caseload numbers. And um, because if you have a, f a finite revenue source and you have 200 families or 400 families, um, then you're going to need to make sure that your staffing ratio is appropriate to the number of people that you need to serve. So um, think about generally, as we complete this box, what are your sources of revenue for your program that you're um, implementing? whether it's a program to serve um, communities or individual families, or if it's just related to your organization and you wanna do um, staff development work or change management and leadership, where does the money come from? And then what are some of the associated costs that would be necessary to actually implement your program or your initiative? And just fill out those two boxes um, pretty generally right now because you don't have all the budget information that you would necessarily have, um, but you can at least start identifying the line items or the uh, different details of your revenue and um, expenditures. Does that make sense? I'll give you just a minute to jot that down. So I'm curious to hear, what are some of your revenue sources that you came up with? Here's one right here, Cheryl. Tell us your uh, problem and your solution and what your revenue is. So just, we um, list access to care problem, um, transitions, um, data accuracy, and availability. Um, if it's not analyzed, <laughs> you can't use it. Right. Um, some of the solutions, we had several so different things because we look at it from different views. Um, we were looking at um, expanding telehealth, we looked at partnerships and collaborations, and of course we put funding on there. Um, more funding is always a great solution. <laughs> Some of our targeted customers, um, we list providers. Um, those are your subspecialty um, medical providers. 
We also, um, PCPs as well, because we need to educate those in our rural areas and uh, across the state. Uh, we list our parents, patients. We also list vendors. Uh, when you think of DME, um, we list our stakeholders, but that's from a different perspective on our end. We're looking at legislative and um, also our other cabinet agencies. Um, we're Kentucky, so we're not set up like a lot of the states. Mm -hmm. um, the Department of Health is completely separate from our Office for Children with Special Health Care Needs, so it's a little different. Uh, DCBS as well. Um, so when we were looking at cost structure and the revenues, the cost structure, I just made up a number, of course, I mean, without looking at a specific project. Um, so say $2 million, just throw it out there. But you're looking at personnel, training the personnel for any newly implemented uh, projects, um, systems, purchasing the equipment, um, all of those things need to be considered. The software as well. Um, also, we were looking at the different type of funding streams. We do, we're unique, so we do do a call settlement. So that would be like our primary funding. Um, you have a little general funds, which is state uh, appropriation funds. Um, and we also have our grant funds. I mean, there's always several grants to apply for. But if you don't know they're out there, I mean, you just have to research and see what grants are available. But our primary source would be uh, cost settlements from our uh, agency. Great, good job. Okay, I'm gonna move us along because we're almost out of time. Um, so there's two more boxes to fill in, and I'll just explain them quickly. So the um, box on metrics, Every organization has a few key numbers, right, that it uses to measure how well it's performing. And these numbers can be used to measure progress and also help you identify mid-course corrections. Um, so here are some metrics from Dave McClure. They're called pirate metrics because when you look at all the letters, they spell R, or ARG or something like that. Um, but anyway, activation basic, I mean, acquisition basically says the point at which you make someone who's unaware of your service um, a customer. So they, they become an interested prospect. So when you're measuring acquisition, you're trying to measure how do people find out about what you have in terms of your services. Um, for example, if you have a flower shop, getting someone to walk by your window and come into your shop is considered an acquisition event. So if you're out in the community and you're doing community health fair and people stop by your booth, if we're at the, at the exhibit tomorrow night and you come to our Workforce Development Center booth, that's an acquisition event. That means that you could potentially be a prospect for us in the future. Um, activation means the interested com customer actually has their first gratifying experience. So again, like the flower shop, if the person comes in and buys these beautiful roses, you've now activated them. They've had a great experience. If you come to our Workforce Development Center booth and you sign up and say, yeah, we want to come into your next cohort, we have now had an activation event. And we are going to assure you that you're going to have a great experience. Retention is when people actually are repeated customers. They come back um, because they're engaged with what you have to offer. Um, I know when I was in a health department, we would measure the opposite of engagement as no-shows, right? We'd have, like, in our dental clinic, a 50% no-show rate. Well, those customers are definitely not engaged in the service that we're providing. Um, and then you'll have revenue measures. So these are activities for which you get compensation. So these could be health insurance payments. These could be grants. They could be cost settlement dollars, um, contracts that you might have, Medicaid dollars. And then you also want to measure, do other people tell people about your service? So how do you measure referrals? Do people who have used the Workforce Center before tell other states and then other people come and say, yeah, Kentucky told us about this um, Workforce Center and now we want to uh, participate. That's a referral. And so these are all just some examples of ways that you would measure on your uh, lean canvas how well you are actually reaching your customers getting them to use your service or product, and then getting them to tell other people about you so that you 
um, can understand whether people are having a great first experience or not. So jot down a few metrics on your canvas, ways that you're going to measure how effective you are being um, in delivering your product or service. And then after that, go ahead and um, figure out what is your unfair advantage. So this is to make you think about how you are different and how that difference really matters. So we have unfair advantages in government. Um, we have certain regulations that require people to do stuff that we want them to do. Um, a lot of businesses don't have that, um, but we do have that as an advantage. We maybe have insider information because we are government that other people don't have or other companies don't have. We have lots of data. That's an advantage for us. We have a lot of data about our potential prospects or our customers that other um, people may not have. Um, we have certain authority, being uh, governmental public health, um, to have people use our services or follow through with what we're recommending. We do a lot of work in building partnerships, so we have broad, network, broad networks of people who are um, in positions of influence, which is an advantage for us. Um, and we have our community relationships that we can leverage as well. So um, Jason Cohen says, a real unfair advantage is something that can't easily be copied or bought. And so we need to recognize that these are our assets, that as maternal and child health professionals, we have certain assets and advantages that we can leverage. So go ahead and fill out that box, um, speaking specifically to how you um, or your organization is advantaged in terms of being able to reach the customers and deliver the service that you want to deliver. Maybe you have a mandate. That's an advantage as well. So take a few minutes, do those two boxes, and then I'm going to uh, wrap us up. OK, so basically, um, we've walked through this process of completing a Lean Canvas on one idea or innovation. Um, what you would do is you would do this for each solution or problem that you're addressing. And then you would try to identify where your risks are. So risk can be um, related to uncertainty. Um, that there's potentially more than one possibility that could happen as a result of your intervention, um, and you're not exactly sure which way things will go. But there can also be a state of uncertainty where there's actually a catastrophic or a very negative outcome that you would want to avoid. So when you come up with um, ideas about how to address a problem with a particular customer segment, you want to be clear whether you're just dealing with uncertainty which is, well, there may be a couple of different outcomes, or whether you're really dealing with a situation where something bad could happen. And then you probably want to um, avoid that or at least be aware of that. Um, you can compare your lean canvases to prioritize your next steps. And, and often the criteria to use has to do with people's level of pain. Like, how awful is this experience for people or this problem? Um, how easy can you reach them? Do you have um, a, a price cost margin that's going to work in terms of having sufficient revenue? Um, is the customer segment large enough so that you're going to actually see an impact? And then is it feasible for you to implement the solutions that you're um, proposing? And always ask advisors, share your plans with people who are experts, ask them for their feedback because you're going to have some blind spots and you may not necessarily um, be able to see them. And then once you decide on what you're going to do, put your best team together and experiment. Make sure your team is cross-functional. They come from different areas of your organization. Um, do this work quickly, so, and then use the learning to refocus and um, change your direction if need be. Um, validate qualitatively, so ask people about the experience, but then actually collect quantitative data to verify that. Um, take the results back to your team and use dashboards so that you can make adjustments. Um, communicate your learning early and often. This is just a series of PDSA cycles for the most part. And then interview your stakeholders and your customers about their experiences. You really want them to have a phenomenal experience or at least leave with a, a good feeling about their interaction with you. 
So Henry Ford said if I'd asked people what they wanted, they would have said faster horses. So obviously he, he understood what they meant, that they wanted something faster than the horses they were, drive, they were riding. But they hadn't really conceptualized an automobile. So he was a visionary. He was an innovator. He said, yeah, they don't yet know about automobiles, but I know they're going to be faster than horses, and they're going to like them. Um, and so that's what our job is. It's not always to ask the customer what's going to help them, because they may not necessarily know, but they have an idea of what's going to help them solve their problem. And then you can innovate and design the interventions um, to meet their needs. So in summary, um, solving problems includes the ability to understand the nature of the problem, identify solutions, know what the resource needs are, and then monitor and evaluate the results. And in order to do that, you have to have strong leadership skills, um, excellent communication skills, and be able to manage teams in a way that produces the best results. And that's what's going to move the needle on MCH outcomes. And then um, building competencies and capacities through a, a healthy work culture, implementing innovations that are accountable and sustainable um, are the best ways to use your human and fiscal resources to maximize your impact. So with that, um, these are our sources. If you're interested in doing further reading on any of these subjects, we really appreciate your attention. The Workforce Center is going to be um, around the rest of the conference. We're doing some posters tomorrow night. And then Monday, there's actually a workshop that Amy Mullenix is doing on value proposition statements if you want to learn more about how to do those. Um, so I think that concludes our session. Thank you. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.